So today we'll be going over uh, white tea. Uh, the tea that we'll be uh, drinking is Bai Mu Dan, B A I M U D A N, um, and you can find it in your uh, uh, crash course kit if you haven't done that already. It's uh, uh, the metallic, uh, like a silver bag. The tea uh, looks like this. So uh, this is five grams of tea. Uh, in the last two days, we have done uh, yellow tea and green tea. That was four grams each. This is five grams. And you might be wondering why is this tea so much? Um, so the number one reason why a tea is so fluffy would be due to whether or not the tea has involved shape making or not. So the number one thing for white tea, the uh, first, uh, Sorry, the, it says pause to do a uh, poor connection. So the white teas uh, do not involve any shape making. So it's not rolled, it's not straightened, nothing is done, the tea was just kind of left to be. And because of that, it usually is the most fluffy tea and it's also a nightmare for transportation. So uh, usually when we uh, ship white tea, it has a very high risk of uh, uh, being crushed, becoming busy, things like that. Um, Another factor that contributes to the uh, size of the tea or the volume of the tea would be the picking grade. So this is a mixed spring by Mundan. Uh, so by this point, the tea has become a little bit more mature. You notice that it has a lot of buzz, but still at the same time, the leaves has uh, opened up more and that makes the tea look a little bit bigger as well. So if you compare this with a, uh, a white tea that I picked earlier in the season, uh, the reason this one is fluffier would be because of that. But even if you have a, a but only white tea, it'll still be very, very fluffy. All right, so now let's all take a look at the leaves. Um, with white tea, we're going to use uh, not two of the uh, fairness pitchers, so it's not open uh, vessel method. We're going to use a guy one to brew the tea. And then keep in mind, white tea actually, uh, I would say up until 2014, is still very, very common in China for people to brew white tea also just in glass with open vessel. And you should try that at home uh, to see the difference in the taste it yields. And um, so it's, you can consider it's almost like two school, different schools of brewing, open vessel or closed vessel. And it was only uh, in the recent years that the, a lot of the teas start to uh, uh, get reshuffled into a brewing style. And uh, white tea, we started to use uh, a guy want to brew the tea. But back in the days, it's also used glasses. It's very recently as well. Cool. Um, so when we put the tea in the gaiwan, this one is going to be a little bit more challenging uh, just because it's kind of fluffy. So uh, make sure you put the tea on a piece of paper. If you have an actual lotus, you can use that as well, but a piece of paper will work. And you can just slide the tea into the gaiwan. And you immediately notice that some of the pieces are sticking out, right? Um, if you're at home by yourself, feel free to use your hand to just kind of make it uh, fall in place. Uh, but of course, sometimes if you're in front of guests, especially, you know, it's not your best friend or something, uh, then you do not want to do that. Uh, so how would you, we make all the tea that falls into the guy want? And this has a lot of, make sure your water is boiling, please. Um, and this is how uh, you're gonna do. It's very much like when you cook noodles. You know how uh, if your noodle is longer than the than the the uh, diameter of the wok, then uh, you you put it in, and the, when the, the 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 front end is soft, and you can push the whole noodle in. So very similar to that as well. But we're going to use the lid to do that. So uh, I just have a habit of always holding the lid in my hand. So you go around the guy one. Okay. And you can just brush it all in. The tea will soften as soon as you put the water in. And we're not going to let the tea rest. And we're going to dump out the first brew. Again, you want to be high water, low tea, right? So when the tea comes out, you want it to be very soft and very uh, quiet. Always make a habit of smelling the lid. Oh. This tea smells so good. Um, it has a particularly mead quality to it. Uh, so mead is uh, the, the wine that's made from honey, right? the honey wine. 
Um, uh, in my earlier camping years, uh, we used to drink uh, a lot of meat around campfire, and it's just one of the best things. I wouldn't say like I was pretty sure love meat, but drinking meat around bonfire is, is definitely one of my favorite things. So uh, is you can drink it warm. So um, you can say this is a honey note. You know, if if uh, if using term meat it does not connect you with the with your guest. However, uh, I would say meat have a particular aroma um, that you can also find in honey but in meat it just seems to have even higher definition of it and it's definitely what is in the aroma of this tea um, also another thing I immediately noticed is there's a lot of warmth in uh, the aroma as well and this is a sign of a sun-dried white tea so traditionally white teas are all sun-dried and this makes all the hair in the white tea to fully soak in all the uh, the, 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 the sun and um, it's like a, a sun soak cotton note so if you uh, like I'm from China so uh, I'm used to seeing people taking their clothes out to sun dry and sometimes people even take the comforter out to sun dry and when you um, this comforter soak up all the sun and you bury your head into it and it's it has a particular aroma to it and that is the aroma of this tea as well it's uh, it's quite amazing all right so you do not need to drink the first brew uh, is to wake up the tea uh, because the first brew is mostly just the aroma of the tea and it tastes a little bit diluted. Uh, in Chinese tea drinking culture, it's basically considered rude to give your guests the first brew. But for if you want to evaluate the tea, feel free to drink the first brew if it's the first time you encounter a tea. Because the first brew does carry a lot of the good information about a tea. Uh, I'm going to save a cup to have a sip and I'm going to give the rest to my tea pet. Alright. So feel free to slurp when you drink the tea, but don't like over slurp. Uh, so the floral note definitely comes through more in the um, uh, when I drank the tea, but keep in mind this is just the first brew of the tea, which is still most of the aroma of the tea and does not have the actual taste of the tea yet. So you, when we brew tea back to back like this, it actually helps us to understand the tasting element of these as well. All right. Warmth and flower, I think that's the two uh, things that stand out the most to me for the rinse. All right. And now we're going to do the first brew. Don't forget the strainer. Open, grab the tea, and pour it out. Going around the rim of the strainer. Not at the center, all right. Cool. Put it down. And you always want to make a habit of smelling the lid. Mm. The meat quality really comes through. And this particular white tea also has a, um, uh, uh, like a herbaceous note to it as well. Um, it's a little bit like a uh, apricot kernel. So it's like a very intense almond milk kind of note to it. Uh, or very intense cherry juice, but it's 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 concentrated kind of feeling to it. All right, let's have a sip, and also notice how much the tea has shrank in your gaiwan, and that's also the thing. You know, if a tea is very fluffy, it'll shrink with brewing. If a tea is tightly rolled, like a tea guan yin, it'll expand when you brew the tea. Mm. Okay, when you drink the tea, that intense apricot kernel note or the cherry note comes through even more. So white tea is a tea that can be aged. Um, and this meat note is particularly what comes through during aging. Now I do want to warn you, there's so many, like the white tea... <laughs> <coughs> the white tea aging property had really been... Uh, uh, overplayed uh, in the recent years. Uh, it's literally not until in also around 2014, 2015 time that people start uh, talking about the aged white tea. And uh, I would say pretty much all aged white tea, uh, like if it's very, very old, it's just leftover tea. Now, the uh, a lot of times when I taste uh, what people call an aged white tea, it really just tastes like the tea had been baked. 
Uh, so it's not an H taste. The H taste has a very high clarity of the neat note. Uh, this one is from 2012, so it's not even that old. So now I'm going to um, save the first brew in the separate cup. Uh, you can also just keep brewing uh, if you want. I'm gonna reboil the water a little bit. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about white tea processing. Uh, white tea is often called the least processed tea, and it has nothing to do with the picking grade. Uh, I think it has a lot to do with uh, the uh, Snapple commercial from a long time ago. The people think uh, if you pick a single butt that makes a white tea, but it's actually not. It has nothing to do with the picking grade. Um, white teas are um, uh, sun-dried, so uh, it never goes on very high temperature. Okay, for the second brew. Now even the uh, the herbaceous note even comes through in the aroma as well. So after you pick white tea, uh, you will put a tea maker will put the white tea onto these uh, bamboo trays. Back in the days, it's all bamboo tray, and nowadays people sometimes use other synthetic material. It's a bit lighter, so one person can handle the whole thing. If you put on bamboo tray, it's a little heavier, and it only. Uh, uh, two people needs, it, are needed to handle the thing. But anyway, so you spread the tea under the tray and uh, usually for tea making the trays are round, but for white tea making the trays are usually in a very long uh, rectangular shape. This allows us to prop the tea up when we sun dry the tea. So uh, we put the tea onto the tray and by the time the fresh leaves come back is usually around right before sunset, right? So uh, we take the tea inside to let the tea uh, stay in shade for overnight. And you want to make sure it's a very thin layer so uh, there's no moisture trapped in the tea. And then the next morning, you will take the tea outside for the tea to uh, sun dry. Uh, you do need to take the tea inside if the sun is too strong, like around the noontime and stuff. So. Oftentimes when we see a tea maker making white tea, uh, they seem like they just sit around the tea uh, and occasionally they'll shift, sh uh, shuffle the tea around, change the direction a little bit, and they just keep sitting and waiting for the tea. Um, so why is that? It's because the tea maker is actually trying to find the optimal angle for the tea to catch the sunlight, but also at the same time to catch the wind at the right direction. You do not want the tea to face the wind directly, right? So because if you look, Tea face the wind directly, it's all gonna get blown off. But you do want the wind to uh, cool the tea from underneath. So it creates this cycle of the sun dry and then the, tea, uh, the wind. Um, and this really helps to maintain the tea's color and to prevent uh, um, a level of oxidation as well. So that's why a very high grade white tea always look very light in the color. And once you brew it, it should not really have like a brownish color if it's a butt only white tea. Let's try the second brew. Mm. So see, this is if you compare the difference between the second brew versus the difference of the rinse, you notice that this is what we call the substantial taste, right? It has so much more uh, reality of the taste to offer you. It's not just a uh, a little bit like every suggestion of the tea might taste like. So that's the difference. And we're just going to use this as exercise to, to quickly teach our mind what is the aroma and what is the taste. Of course, with every sip, you're always going to have the aroma and the taste. All right. 
And sometimes if you purchase a, a really a fancy a branded white tea from China, you notice on the package it'll say 60, to 60 hour uh, sun drying or 72 hour sun drying. Obviously you cannot have 60 hours of straight sun dry. But what I'm really trying to say is this prolonged processing of white tea. So, and this is the signature uh, step in making white tea. Remember we talked about how kill green is the signature step for making green tea, and then the yellowing is the signature step for making yellow tea. And this prolonged wilting of the tea is basically what makes white tea uh, the tea. A lot of commercial white teas nowadays are actually made within four hours. But if you do able to, or you are able to prolong the process of white tea, it produces a very, very pristine kind of taste note. Like if everything is just high clarity, um, it's like the water is just so clear and clean. And that's what we really want in a good white tea. Okay. I'm gonna pour my second brew away as well, and then we're gonna move on to the third brew. And we're gonna talk a little bit more. So how's uh, everyone doing? I hope you're enjoying your white tea. Oh, I do want to remind you to uh, uh, keep some white tea leaves at the end of the day and make sure you chew on it. And this is already starting to uh, uh, the point that I wanted to make with after this whole experiment is over. Um, uh, today we're gonna have a first glimpse of it. So basically, uh, if you had tasted the uh, root leaves of the uh, green and yellow tea, you notice how tender the leaves are. This white tea, remember, is also a butt and two leaves in the picking grade, so it's very comparable to the uh, uh, to the yellow tea that we had. However, uh, this tea now is gonna uh, taste like sandpaper. So if you chew on it, the texture and everything, um, and this is why we do. Uh, it does not. Uh, have to be brewed in an open vessel and it can withstand the high temperature of the gaiwan. There's no such thing as if the tea is picked too tender that you will want to use less than boiling temperature. White tea is one of the hardest teas. You cannot ruin a white tea. No matter how much you press onto it, it should never be unpleasantly astringent. So, it's always to do with the fermentation level of the tea and does not have anything to do with the picking grade. All right. Um, so now let's try this third brew. Alright. Um, so this third brew, you start to taste a little bit even more body of the tea, right? Uh, it has a little bit more tannins, but overall white tea is never going to be like unpleasantly tannic. And also this prolonged making process make it very, uh, like basically not bitter. I would say white tea is like the vanilla of tea. It might not be your absolute favorite, but uh, it's hard to find somebody getting very offended by the taste of the white tea. It's very uh, easy to drink. So it's always safe to offer your friend if, you, if you're not sure what they like or not like. All right. Um, so the, the texture is a little bit more fuller and it feels a little bit more complex as well. Uh, it also gave me a sense that the, the, the overall texture is a little bit fuller. So the, in terms of the taste of the tea, it always goes like this. So it's almost like a bell curve. Uh, so right now, uh, if I know this tea can produce 9 to 10 brews, uh, right now we're only on the third brew, so it's still climbing up the curve, right? Um, so, uh, what to finish the processing of white tea, oftentimes, uh, traditionally, we actually do bake the red white tea with charcoal, but it's also with very, very dim fire. This, again, helps to solidify the, uh, all the notes of the tea to enhance aroma and then to uh, repel impurity. You have to be very, very careful of this step because you do not want the white tea to actually taste baked. Uh, that'll mean that you have this fire in the tea, right? So um, we wanted to, uh, this is a, a step that does not alter the taste of the tea. It really helped to enhance it, all right? Um, so next, let's talk a little bit about the uh, location of white tea because, um, uh, uh, you know, the three factors for uh, making a really good tea is location, the varietal, and then the processing. So the location for white tea, now white tea, given its popularity, is produced uh, all over the world now. <coughs> Sorry. 
sorry about that. Um, so it's produced all over the world now, and then even within China, you have multiple tea regions that actually make white tea. The, uh, however, uh, white tea is what we call a dual true origin. So there are two locations that are considered the historical origins of the white tea and therefore demands the highest price. Uh, and it's Fuding and Zhenghe. Zhenghe must uh, have very little white tea activities now. It's kind of on a decline. So we're going to wait and see what happens to this tea region. Uh, so now, it, in the modern time, basically the real center for white tea is fooding. So in order for a white tea to, uh, uh, to, to, to summer impressive, it needs to be a fooding white tea. Uh, now Fuding is actually a secondary uh, city, so it's basically, it's also pretty sizable basically. Um, there is a township in Fuding called Diantou, um, and that is really the hub for trading the tea and also for trading the fresh uh, uh, leaves of the tea. Uh, Diantou has one of the most uh, impressive and mature tea trading market in uh, any production origin. The market literally would have a uh, finished tea trading uh, market in the morning and then a fresh tea trading market in the, uh, in the afternoon when the fresh leaves come back. And you really do not see this large scale of fresh tea trading uh, fresh leaf trading anywhere else in uh, China's tea producing region. So it's very impressive. And uh, the, there's uh, is one township that's kind of uh, uh, have a higher elevation than any other township in the Fuding region and it's called Panxi. And even though uh, white tea is not, the terroir is not as specified as some of the historically famous teas like the green yellow teas that we tasted. However, uh, that sense of, uh, of, of hierarchy of the different uh, locations is mer emerging. And the, right now, um, it's separated mostly um, uh, with the Panxi because it's a lot higher than the other places. It's considered more desirable uh, for fresh leaves than the other ones. But a very major thing for white tea is actually, uh, one, is the varietal or the cultivar that we use. And then secondly, is the um, uh, whether or not the tea is uh, wild. So I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit when we, after we brew the forced brew. So now let's uh, pick this out. So once again, you wanna go around the rim, put the lid on, put the strainer on, slide open, Grab and pour around. Be as low as possible without touching and be very quiet in the uh, brewing motion. Put it down, smell the lid. Ooh. So nice. Like there's like a sweet uh, flower nectar kind of uh, note coming out now. Mm, it is very floral now. The um, and sometimes uh, we will have some customer who uh, specifically want a certain uh, herbal tea, and then we don't have any herbal tea. But if I hear them mentioning about chamomile, I will also sometimes recommend this white tea because it does have a little bit of like a chamomile flower note to it. Uh, chamomile or chrysanthemum or similar uh, kind of aroma. All right, so for uh, the uh, varietals or the cultivars of white tea, uh, there are several ones that are being used in the white tea region. Uh, right now, the uh, just like any uh, region, you have indigenous varietal. Uh, over uh, in the fooding region, the, their indigenous varietal, which is a mix of many different cultivars, so it's heirloom, so by definition, it's not a cologne, uh, would be, uh, they call it xiao cai cha, or little veggie tea. Uh, it's a small leaf varietal and uh, it's very intense uh, but uh, very very nice yeah 
Um, if you, I'm gonna give you a tip. Uh, in the future, if you ever come to Tea Drunk, you should mention about the little veggie tea. Uh, we have it, but we don't have it on the menu because it's uh, very limited. And but we only want to serve it to the ones who are able to, uh, you know, who know about the tea and able to mention. It's from 2013, uh, so it's a it's a very intense kind of flavored uh, white tea. Very nice. Now we also have um, uh, a varietal called uh, China Tea Number no. One. Uh, China tea number one is called the Fuding Da Hao, uh, sorry, Fuding Da Pai. Yeah, and uh, as you, the name suggests, it's a very old cultivar uh, uh, that scientists developed uh, early on in the research era of the, uh, of the tea. So uh, this is a me medium sized uh, uh, varietal, medium leaf varietal. Um, and because of uh, uh, certain uh, things happened in the past, it's no longer uh, uh, available. Um, in abundance in the region and it is a clone, but it's actually the rarest clone of the region Which is China tea number two. Uh, sorry, China tea number one. Majority of the white tea nowadays that we have um, uh, In the region that's also considered a more desired varietal is a uh, clone called China tea number two Which is Fu Ding Da Hao. Yeah, uh, so China tea number two uh, is a largely varietal So the the butt is very big, right? And then the leaves are also very very big that's what you saw in the fresh leaves the the butt side the, the length of the butt alone is probably the size of the leaf for Huang Ya and Hua Pian um, and there's also another clone that has a very high yield and is largely used for making commercial grade tea and it's called Fu Yin number no. six uh, it's very light uh, it does not have a lot of uh, uh, complexity and actual taste but it's quite pleasant it's more known for its aroma than anything else it's also super super white uh, so um, if you ever encounter a white tea like that it's probably for number six um, but the goal is for production is not for uh, you know the, the, the level of taste that we're looking for also in this region right now there are a lot of uh, uh, tea trees that so basically over cultivation is a major problem in the region right now and uh, because of this uh, it's very important to secure the tea that's uh, have a uh, that's like some level of wild so uh, and the wild tea usually in the region only means that it's abandoned tea so uh, means that people have planted and then have left the tea to be and it can be as little as just uh, you know 15 20 years or as many as four decades uh, depends on uh, what you do it actually has many different levels of uh, uh, wildness to it uh, so that's why you'll see the majority of uh, uh, tea drugs white tea um, uh, since 2014 are all wild tea uh, wild teas actually uh, these are wild teas are from very high mountain area right uh, is to prevent any uh, possible problems with the tea and also another thing I want to mention is the picking grade for white tea. So white teas are actually named after picking grades. So in a way, there are only four grades uh, for white tea. So four name or four names for white tea. That's the naming convention. So the highest picking grade you have a bud only, which is uh, a silver needle, and the second grade picking grade, which is a bud in two leaves, you have a bang dan, which can be translated to. Uh, uh, white peony, and then you have the third picking grade, which is gong mei, and the last picking grade, which is called shou mei. Um, and if a tea does not come from the, the traditional region, sometimes it does not follow this kind of naming grade, uh, uh, naming convention, but all the traditional white teas should follow this naming convention. But keep in mind, picking grade is not everything. Remember, the number one factor that impacts the desirability of the tea is the location. And then you have the varietal and the processing. Uh, and the processing is all together, right? It's from the harvesting, from the picking grade, all the way to the finishing steps. So these can all be uh, uh, put together as the processing. So as you can see, it's only one small aspect of one of the three main factors that impacts the taste of white tea. And also, um, so I'm going uh, to move into questions very soon. I'm gonna bring the uh, phone closer to my face. Before I do that though, uh, I do want to mention, so now we're at the the fourth uh, brew of the tea, so we're pretty much at the, the height of the tea. And then later on, once you are, are into like the sixth, sixth or seventh brew of the tea, feel free to uh, steep the tea for a little bit longer, for maybe five to three seconds longer for each um, 
subsequent brew and also at the same time uh, the last brew you maybe the tenth brew you want to let the tea sit for uh, a pretty long time give it a couple minutes right you still want warmth in the tea so you do not want to let the tea sit for re for too long that you completely lose the warmth of the tea and once you do that taste the tea again um, and this is basically what we're uh, doing to kind of kill the tea to looking for uh, any of the last flaws of the tea to really get to know the tea to see if the teas do have any flavor to give things like that so always feel free to do that with your tea once you're uh, about to finish as well all right so now i'm going to uh, bring the uh, the phone closer to my face so i can see the questions and stuff All right. Wang Mu Dan. Uh, I've never heard of that before. Oh, you mean Mu Dan Wang, probably. So Mu Dan Wang is basically means, so when you have the uh, picking window for uh, silver needle or uh, the Bai Hao engine, right? The, the, the butt only white tea versus the uh, butt, and only, uh, butt and one to two leaves for uh, Bai Mu Dan, you can have overlapping windows. So sometimes people are unwilling to uh, sell their Bai Mu Dan uh, to be lumped together with a uh, mist spring Bai Mudan like the one that we tried today. So uh, what we're trying to say is that this is a Bai Mudan that could have made it into a silver needle but have chosen not to do that. So it's a terminology that's been recent years people start to adopt to call it the King Bai Mudan to just symbolize that it's my choice to wanting to make it into a Bai Mudan and not a silver needle. I've been told that white tea is helpful for migraines was... Um, so, uh, so, so white tea, uh, so tea has, uh, 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 the, one of the leading amino acid in tea is called, uh, theanine and it's, uh, the chorality is L, so it's oftentimes also called L-theanine, it's the same thing, and the, um, so this, this uh, amino acid, uh, sometimes uh, in some regions, uh, some, some countries, people think that it has um, uh, uh, a lot of health for our uh, neuro neurological health. So um, in the US, actually, currently, uh, that is not a statement that's being endorsed. But I know in Japan, people do um, uh, sometimes take concentrated uh, theanine pills and you can buy concentrated theanine pills uh, on Amazon as well and that's the compound that's supposed to help clear your mind but keep in mind also in high concentration catechin which is the polyphenol in tea also have a similar effect as uh, not similar but it's also very good for the neurological health but in a different way um, white tea and the, the theanine is more concentrated in the butt than in the leaves so sometimes people will uh, uh, probably find that is the reason why uh, uh, the having white tea is very helpful for the headache and um, but also keep in mind that sometimes people drink white tea they also feel the caffeine more than the theanine so it's really about the balance between the caffeine and the theanine that can make you feel one way or the other uh, I myself also do feel like um, uh, white tea helps with uh, clearing my mind not like if I have a very serious headache but if I feel like a little bit foggy having uh, a very some white tea definitely helps white tea Oh, so I was very much stay away from any white tea cakes. So as of now, there's no uh, high grade of white tea uh, or high quality white tea, I should say, ever being pressed into cakes. Uh, so pressing white tea into cakes is a recent practice. It's mostly due to uh, even nowadays still there is a large uh, surplus of white tea production. So in order to uh, kind of get uh, to solve that problem, people will press white tea into cakes and into both picky bags on the poor trend and also uh, for easy storage and the one uh, and you have to understand this is just how the tea industry kind of works in terms of supply chain basically uh, 
tea will not get pressed into the cake right at the tea season. So uh, does the tea boss move in to buy the tea? All the better teas have the first uh, picking. So you, you select those teas first. So it's only the leftover tea. So the teas that people did not want, those are the teas that are being pressed into cakes. And that's why they get pressed uh, into cakes throughout the, the year. And also uh, in white tea region, because pressing into cakes is a later practice, the technique is not very mature. And also people People usually do not dry the cakes naturally they will actually bake the tea dry and that's why the white tea cakes always have this baked taste in tea which is remember is a big no-no for white tea um, and the white pour there's not really such a thing as a white pour because uh, white tea or pour is really already determined by how you actually process the tea so white pour is usually either uh, people press uh, will pick the picking grade that's really for white tea but processing the pour way or it's really people using the raw, same raw material for pour but have made it into a white tea such as like the moonlight white the yue guang bai things like that um Oh, peony. So peony is uh, is the flower, you know. The, um, so it's not peony is not. Uh, I wouldn't say it's common in white tea. It's one of the. Uh, it's a uh, uh, the in the name of one of the four picking grades of white tea. Now peony. Um, is uh, what in China people consider the national flower. Um, and there are so many uh, poems uh, praising peony, but there are many different kinds of peony. It's the peony with the wooden stem, not the peony with the, 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 the soft stem, which we uh, more commonly see in the States, actually. So the, um, and supposedly it's the way you, uh, uh, the second pig engraved the white tea when you have a bud or uh, a, a, a bud in leaf or a bud in two leaves when you brew the tea in a glass the tea will open up and supposedly that looks like a peony uh, even though I, I cannot draw that uh, analogy at all but the uh, but but that's the how the tea got its name from it was just the the look of the open tea reduce size it would be graded in the same way uh, Yes and no. So I have seen both ways. So really depends on, uh, just keep in mind, the traditional tea region are always the most conservative. People tend to follow the already established protocols around the, uh, the location, the varietal, and the processing, right? And that's why it, like uh, traditional tea regions are so important is because even though you can you can say location is not everything, but everything else becomes more of a default setting if you find the right location. So that's why location is so, so important. But outside of China, I have seen white tea produced in India that people will either call it a silver needle um, in order to be able to connect with the consumer more. So you know, so if you have a consumer that already know what it is, or people will give it other like fancy names to, uh, to, to be able to sell the tea. So commercial teas is more flexible because it's more market oriented, even though everything is more market oriented. But just keep in mind that traditional tea regions are more conservative in preserving the protocols around all these all right. and let me see how do you know how many brews the tea leaves can produce <laughs> Uh, so that's a very good question how do we know how many brews a tea leaf will produce so at the beginning we don't know right and then, so we test it and um, in the brewing session I keep mentioning how you want to always think of flavor as a limited inventory so you, our first job in uh, before we can strategize how we want to brew the tea is always to get to know the tea first and to get to know the tea uh, you have to uh, play around with the tea many different times right to in order to know that um, but just like you know if you are a very experienced chef you do not need to uh, like if, even if you, uh, you know, if you cook like your your whole life, and then you uh, encounter a new ingredient or your new material, you will have a good idea of how to treat this ingredient or material. So with tea, the same thing. So over time, you start to having uh, enough experience to just kind of uh, uh, can you can have an educated guess of how many brew the tea will produce. Because for most of the tea, especially the teas that sell in the Western market, for most of the tea, by looking at the raw, uh, by looking at the fresh, uh, sorry, not the fresh, the dry tea leaves, you already have a pretty good idea of what this tea is and how uh, this tea will perform. And only when you're really not sure, then you always, you know, you want to brew the tea to test it out and then you'll know for sure. Um. 
Would you ever consider uploading it to YouTube? Um, we'll see. I mean, this is very casual. You know, it's more conversational. Um, I feel like with YouTube, one thing is I already uh, struggle uh, with uh, Instagram Live because uh, the 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 Q and A session is always more fun because I feel like there's feedback. But otherwise, you know, it's a quite a challenge for a non TV professional like me to just talk to a screen and i feel i don't know i just feel youtube seems a little bit more serious than <laughs> the instagram life maybe i need to like have some training and stuff i can't just uh you know start on my word and then doing things like huh uh, like things like that but i feel like with the uh, instagram life it's a bit more casual more conversational and people are more forgiving of these kind of things is a kettle the temperature can be set um, I don't use uh, kettles with a lot of the buttons just because I think it's it's more complicated and I really only just need the water to boil and um, if I had to press multiple buttons to achieve that goal that's not kind of what I wanted but if you um, but it's really up to you you know like everybody have different uh, habits of using a kettle I would say it's more of a habit thing than anything else show me your back. um Bam Dan for sure, yeah. So Bam Dan is if I I would say uh, a tea connoisseur should have a preference uh, between Bam Dan or Silver Needle because uh, some of the very high picking grade Bam Dan is a um, uh, high picking grade Bam Dan is actually uh, uh, comparable in the picking time with a Silver Needle uh, uh, the uh, by Hao Jin. However, a Bam Dan and Shoumei not only they will have completely different uh, picking time, the season is different. So Bam Dan will just automatically already be better in terms of its raw material, the complexity and the balance it naturally have. And also during the making, there's much more attention and skill that goes into making a Bam Dan than goes into making a Shoumei. So that's why uh, in if everything else is the same, so if we're, it comes from the same location with the same cultivar uh, and uh, other everything else is comparable in processing I would definitely prefer a Bai Mudan but if it's a Bai Mudan that comes from uh, mm, very interesting uh, locations maybe I would prefer Shoumei instead yeah but Shoumei is lighter Shoumei is like it's deeper it's heavier but it's lighter and the Bai Mudan is like it seems lighter but it's deeper wow teas are you already seeing tea pen being climate changes um Actually, it's hard to tell uh, the climate change impacting wild teas. But yes, I think uh, climate change definitely impacts the tea production. Uh, one very simple thing is uh, there's many tea regions that never snow, but we have seen repeated uh, extremely cold weather like hail and snowing in tea region, which is very unusual. And another thing is just about the predictability uh, predict of uh, of the tea season right so um usually people usually tea season is pretty on time i would say back in the days but nowadays you will have a more and more irregular tea season so now basically irregular tea season is the regular tea season whereas before um uh there's certain things around the tea season in terms of the harvesting time uh the climate and stuff like that is more predictable but now it's more uh irregular Uh, white tea is good in hot weather to cool the body. Um, so in general, yes, Chinese uh, medicine thinks that the um, the lighter color teas, like green tea, uh, yellow tea, white tea, has the ability to cool the body. Um, but but I don't know how 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 uh, you know the Western science will view that. And um, in general, I also think white tea because you know the taste is just so mellow and so refreshing cooling it is definitely something that if i feel very dry like this fall this past fall i was drinking so much white tea it just makes me feel so much better hydrated uh, than any other tea i, I feel like i it, it, it feels makes me feel moist uh, so that's my personal feeling and i really uh, enjoy white tea for that aspect and also white tea is a tea that if it cools cools down if you ever just really want to drink a a cold tea not cold brew tea but like an iced tea so you hot brew the tea and then let it leave it cold white tea is excellent for that also if you ever have spicy food and drink white tea after that not only it's uh very soothing for your tongue but also like it's just 
Um, it's so sweet. It's so much sweeter after uh, any spicy food. Oldest tea you have ever drank, and what is the oldest you have ever seen? Um, I have drank uh, some tea that uh, people... Uh, wait, what's the difference? Well, I have, but both for what I've seen and what I've drank uh, were uh, some teas uh, supposedly from the 50s. Yeah, and it was pretty moldy. Uh, I would rather not have drank that. <laughs> um, right? Let me see if there were any uh, past questions. And yeah, sure. So any more questions? Okay. All right. Thank you again, everyone, for uh, you know a, a very good life session for me, at least. All right. I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. So tomorrow we'll be uh, drinking a Phoenix Oolong. Um, so it's a, a heavily fermented medium roasted Oolong. Um, the name of the tea is called Bai Ye. B A I Y E. It's in the wrap packet with like a golden, uh, oh, sorry, like a yellow band around it. So make sure you find that tea, and we're gonna use Guy One again tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, any other food pair recommendation for white tea? Um, because white tea is very, very light, and some of the white tea actually is very melony, so I would uh, probably recommend it to uh, go with like a cucumber salad, things like that as well. Yeah, and uh, certain white tea is also pretty good with like a cakey kind of dessert, so like things that's uh, yeasty and um, uh, like bready, like a flour, not, not like a the, the 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 natural flour but like a wheat flour kind of based uh dessert i think white tea would go really good with that as well like a pump cake or something yay all right bye guys see you tomorrow